So tonight we are teaching on how to heal from grief. So let me make this clear. I don't think you ever do. Entirely. Grief is a process. And depending on how healthy you are in your heart, I think depends on how you process it. Now, um, even before I begin, I'm just going to pray and ask God just to open our eyes of understanding so we're able to understand how to help other people when they go through grief. Father, I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you, God, for understanding and your faithfulness in our life. I ask that you would teach us tonight on grief and how to encourage people and help people in the process that they go through. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've ever been through a divorce, a broken relationship, you've lost your health or a job, or you got fired from a job, or your entire stock market <clears throat> bottomed out and you lost everything, as in the Great Depression, where in one day they went from rich to poor. Um, people went to the extremes in me and jumped off roofs. Um, there were other people that prayed. It, where your heart is usually is how you deal with the trauma and grief you're going through. If you've ever miscarried a child, um, or even if you were forced to retire, we've seen people go through grief. Uh, they miss their job, and they miss being busy and wanted and needed. The death of a pet, big deal. This is a real big deal in this generation. Um, I think if you went back 100 years, the death of a pet, not that big of a deal. People really um, looked at them as workhorses and um, security around their house and maybe a kitten or something. But um, they were not even, some of them were not allowed to attach to animals. Uh, if you grew up on a farm, you learned that the sheep would be slaughtered at the end of the year. So don't get too close to that and don't go naming him, you know. So, but death of a pet now, pets are family members in a lot of homes. Uh, loss of a dream. This is a good one. I'm crying for this one. I can remember. The day, sticks on my brain, the day my son Nicholas walked in and he was scheduled to go into Annapolis and um, be a pilot. He wanted to fly F-14s. He's smart. He, his math was excellent. His vision, his uh, reaction time. He had already gone through his testing. He had had his vaccinations. A couple weeks before that, maybe a week before that, I don't know. And everything tested out. He had recommendations coming in from senators. And top of the cl his class. It looked like he was heading for an Annapolis. And he walked in and he said, Mom, I think I'm sick. And I said, you're sick? And I was sound asleep. I I kind of mumbled, uh, opened my eyes, and he said, I think I have diabetes. And he did. Uh, they wondered if it came from one of the vaccinations. They had vaccinated a huge amount of vaccinations. Um, that that had maybe affected his pancreas. Um, he was in mint shape. But he went from health to just like that, his pancreas had been affected. He wrote a letter to the senator. He wrote a letter to Annapolis, the college, and he said, please, please don't take my dream. 
my, I promise my health will never be a question. And they wrote him back and said, I'm sorry, Nicholas. We can't take you with diabetes. We could not run the risk that your plane would be in the air and your health would jeopardize a crew, a flight crew. I thought I would not recover my heart because I watched his. And yet God had a plan for his life. He would never have been a minister in broken marriages, have five children, married Rebecca, or served God with such a passion. All of that, he looks back now. The things we grieve over sometimes become our stepping stones. God pulls you out, he moves you into something else. A loss of a friendship. There have been friends. Uh, you know, Patty and I, you have a Kleenex? Oh, there's one there. Patty and I have been friends for, I don't know, 50, 60, oh, 60 years probably, 58 years. And uh, we just share cooking recipes and life and, you know, just, what are you doing today? Nothing. Oh, I'm going to work. I've got this, you know, I've got that. But um, at least once a week we chat over just life. And that's a long time to have a friendship. If I lost her friendship, there would definitely be a grief that I would experience. Um, if you sell a family home or a piece of property, I've had people grieve over just the sale of a foundation of where they, their roots, they had to sell this. Um, if you've ever gone through a serious illness with somebody, uh, I grieve sometimes for who they were. I grieved my mama um, suffering from oxygen deprivation, but it responded like Alzheimer's. And that's how it responds. I grieved for four years. She wasn't there. So when it came time for the funeral, I had, I mean, I cried a little bit, but I was happy for her. I had cried so much in four years, there wasn't like any tears left. And I can remember a woman coming up to me and she said, well, it's obvious you didn't love your mom very much. <laughs> you didn't cry. And I thought, how do you know? I said, I've been grieving for four years. Now my heart is at peace that mama can breathe and she can run. You know, and I was there when she passed away, and they were doing CPR on her. I said, Mom, don't let them bring you back. Find Jesus and hang on tight. <laughs> and she did. Said, don't you look back. You, you just go, Mom. Even subtle losses can trigger grief sometimes. And you think, what, what, am I, what am I experiencing? Why am I missing this so much? People graduate from college or all of a sudden they've graduated from high school. And September rolls around and it's time for all the kids to go to school. And they don't go. And the teenager says, oh, I miss high school so much. I miss my friends, I miss the routine, I miss... So grief can come in all different, um, all different ways. The grieving process, how you grieve, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way. I think we grieve differently. I'm rather, and I shared this um, Sunday, I'm rather private in a lot of things. You're not gonna see me post a lot of things on Facebook. I'm real picky that the world doesn't know everything about my heart unless I want them to. I share a lot of personal things here and they hear that on a regular basis. Um, but it doesn't mean I share it with the world. 
So there's, you know, how you grieve um, depends on, I think, your personality, how you cope with things, uh, your life experience, your faith has a lot to do it, do with it, um, and you're growing up. How people interpret things and how you grow up. I can remember, like I said, uh, people would say things years ago. It was like, oh, get over it. You need to move on. Don't you think you've grieved long enough over that? And so you'll hear people that kind of get a little snip if you grieve too long or if your heart hurts and uh, they see you crying. And I remember a woman that had gone through a divorce and it, it was a long process for the divorce. Many tears. And uh, it didn't seem like this divorce was ever going to end and be finalized. And people are like, really? Again? Oh, you'd think they'd just stop crying. You'd think they'd stop grieving over the loss. I'm thinking, do you understand? We don't grieve alike. There's not a normal timetable for grieving like, okay, you have a year. Could you get it done? You got a year. Similar to people that will say, you know, there's a proper timetable on um, after you've miscarried. Um, you should <coughs> wait before you have any more children. After a divorce, you should wait. And um, if you've fallen in love, you, you have this time period in which you have to prove yourself. If you're grieving over the loss of something, um, a year is about what they say you should wear black. I'm serious. And I know I'm going back a couple generations, but a widow needed to look like a widow in mourning for a period of time. It was common. So this is a myth that the pain will go away faster if you just ignore it. Actually, it resurfaces in other ways, in other areas of your life, if you ignore it. Well, I'm going to ignore I'm grieving, but I'm going to yell at my kids. <laughs> and you're going like, what is wrong with you? This, that you didn't deal with right there. It's important that you be strong. Oh, I hated this. My generation was like, toughen up, be strong. What do you think? Uh, I mean, you just, you, you just cannot be shallow in this. Be strong. Big boys don't cry. And uh, people would tell you, you need to, you know, get your strength on. Actually, um, it's okay to feel sad, scared, lonely. And I don't really want people that are going through grief to put on this happy face. Look at me, I'm happy, I'm good. How are you doing? They go, oh, I'm really good. I'm going, you lie like a dog. And they go, you're right, I am lying. But I'm trying to process it. And I had told you the one, if you don't cry, it means you're not grieving. You know what, that doesn't mean anything. Some people actually laugh versus crying. Crying and laughter are twins. People that are grieving many times will just begin to laugh out loud. And um, I know that inside they're crying. But that's how they interpret it. Grieving should last a year. We talked about that. That really comes from hundreds of years ago, teaching that it's about a year long. <coughs> Moving on with your life means that you have forgotten that you lost something. How untrue. That is a myth. You're not allowed to move forward. Because if you do, 
it means that you never grieved this in the first place. All these little judgments people make, I hear it all the time. Acknowledge your pain that it's okay for you to grieve, however you grieve. Support yourself emotionally, and that means take care of your health. Pamper yourself a little. Get a journal. Write your thoughts down. Write a letter to God. But take care of your heart. And don't do it on Facebook. I'm telling you, if you grieve openly on Facebook, you will get a variety of opinions. And some of them you may not like. I see it quite often. In fact, Facebook, this was a, a funny one. A man wrote, oh, I can't believe I have wasted 40 years on you. I wrote underneath there, we're here for you. We'll listen to your heart. And I'm really sorry for your loss. It was a storage shed and he had some personal belongings in it for 40 years, this shed, and he forgot to pay it. His, and they confiscated and locked the shed down. So don't always look at something somebody <laughs> said. I felt so stupid. Oh my God. It was literally his storage shed. I thought it was his wife that he was talking about. So when you look at things online on Facebook, don't automatically judge somebody, oh, they're grieving. Just be careful on how they all grieve differently. How many of you guys are private grievers? You don't share it with the world. I'm private. It's not that I don't grieve. I just don't want anyone jeweling on me. It's the way it goes. Recognize the difference between grief and depression. Um, first of all, in grief, there are five stages. Most of you know this. Denial. Like, this can't really be happening to me. And it almost feels a little surreal. And as long as, it, especially at the, if you've lost somebody or they have passed away, um, as long as you have people around you, it almost is like it didn't happen. People look really good at the funeral. It's afterwards that Nick gets a call that they've attempted suicide. A month after. The funeral that you looked really healthy in, and it looked like you had it together, it was all a farce that you had it together. And so, um, denial, this can't really be happening to me. I think I kind of go through that too. Even with my dad a little bit, when he was sick, I was thinking, nah, he's really not that sick. Nah, that's not how it's going to go. Uh, my brain did not interpret all that was happening. When um, a special nurse sat across me and said, you're going to need to consider hospice on this. Just those words made me go, huh? And of sorts, you go into a denial. If you're going to grieve, many people will grieve in anger. Why is this happening to me? Who's to blame? Something goes wrong, it's the doctor's fault. You're sure of it. Um, why did you lose this person? It was the doctor's fault, or so-and-so's fault, or somebody said this. Um, and so even when you look at the loss of a job, who was behind it? Why did I lose it? Um, why did we have to lose our house? It was your fault. You racked up the bills. Well, you guys lived with me while we racked them up together. I've heard a lot of different stories. But if, the, if it's concerning the death of a loved one, I would say anger. 
I don't know, can start two weeks afterwards, and I've seen it. I'm angry at God. He had to have done this. I'm angry at them that they, um, they took their own life. I'm angry at this. This caused it. Um, I see a lot of finger pointing, but I see a lot. God really takes the blunt in and end of it all the time. I see a lot of people blame God. I see them blame God when their child gets taken away from them because of abuse. It's God's fault. I prayed, and he didn't fix it. Um, I rubbed the genie lamp, called God, and he did not save me. As I look at some of the scriptures, I love this one. Um, pop them up, if you can, Nick. One of my favorites is that God is going to wipe away all your tears. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Interesting um, that God recognizes that there are former things now that are going to pass away. But he, he says sorrow and pain and grief. He acknowledges those things are there. Go ahead, next one. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. I love that part. That's my line. That means he's close to them that are of a broken heart. Um, if you've ever gone through a relationship that ended, that you did everything to repair and you could not repair it. You could not fix the person. God was real close during that moment. And you might not have known it. He brushed shoulders with you continually. He stood at your bedside. He wept over you. He sang over you. I'm thinking, wow. Go ahead, Nick. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. Keep going. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, the disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed... I'm going to go right on down. This is the Beatitudes. But blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comfort comforted. It's not right there. But it's in here. I'm like, really, God? Blessed are you that mourn? So let me give you a different interpretation of this. If I went up to Chris right now and I laid my hand on her, and I said, Chris, I just bless you. And I ask God to bless you with prosperity and, and uh, comfort and kindness. And I begin to speak into her life. I want you to look at it as God saying, blessed are those that mourn. I'm going to lay my hand on them and bless them with comfort. For they will be comforted. So if you take it and you look at it in a different perspective and you see that God is, um, that's the Amplified. You can turn that one off, Nick. I'm going to use just the New King James. God is my portion forever. When everything else fails, he's my portion. Now, in saying this, thanks for those, Nick. In saying this, I don't know very many people in our church that don't run to God. But I know a lot of people in the world that get very angry with God. Even though they have, they have no relationship with Him. But they get very angry with Him when they go through something. He is literally the strength of my life. I can remember the lady, and I probably have told this before, her child drowned. Her little girl, four years old, drowned in the pool. They did everything to save this child, and they couldn't. She came home from the hospital, and family started showing up at the house. They came in, and they sat in the front room. Her aunts and uncles and parents and people started to fill the house, and... Um, she went back to her bedroom, and her husband came in. He said, honey, what can, 
how can I help? She said, get rid of the people. Well, they're not going to leave. I cannot grieve properly if they are on my doorstep looking at me, judging my reaction, testing me to see if I'm responding correctly. She said, now they're talking about the fact. Remember years ago when I was depressed? Remember years ago when I thought life wasn't worth living? Now they're worried I'm going to commit suicide. So they're hounding me. Ever. They're in my kitchen. They follow me into the bathroom. I can't even walk out in the yard without somebody with me. And I got to grieve. But I got to do it my way. Is there any way you can get rid of them? He said, no. But I'll cover for you and you sneak out the back door. And if you need a moment with God, you go take your moment and you find. She goes like, Phew, good. So I went to the front room. They're talking. All these people are filled and you know, the relatives are there. And she sneaks out the back door and runs into the cornfield. When she finally gets in the cornfield, she collapses on the ground and begins to weep. Why? Nobody's staring at her. Nobody's judging her heart. And she says, God... I know you loved her as much as I did. And this is not your fault, God. Most people will say, why? Why did you let her die? Said she's like, God, this was not your fault. She's instantly, she said, she felt a whoosh come on top of her. The presence of God dropped on her. And she said, a gift of grace, it's the only thing I can look at it, covered me. And it was this, as if all the grief sucked right out of me, like. <laughs> and me and God talked for a while, and I was okay. I was okay. Okay to the point that people now were upset that she wasn't a mess, and she wasn't sobbing. And they said she's dealing with it too well. Now they're really worried. She said, no, God came. God came. And he gave me his grace. He gave me his grace. Bargaining. <laughs> I remember a, a couple I had years ago. They were friends of ours. And their baby was in the hospital. He said... God, I'll serve you if you save my baby. And their baby died. And he said, I'll never have anything to do with you again, God. Make this not happen in my life, and I'll give you this. I've had people that could not shake. They could not shake grief. Couldn't do it. Four years they grieved. And they told me. Every night they cried themselves to sleep. Every Saturday they rocked themselves. They did nothing around their house. They rocked in rocking chairs. And they cried and sobbed. And I said, you need to be a soul tie with grief. What do you mean? I said, you actually have a soul time now with the grief. It actually has a time schedule. It comes on you about 8 o'clock at night. It lasts 11 o'clock. And you may sob sometimes at 3 in the morning. And, uh, and then again on the weekends on Saturday. If grief has a time schedule with you, you may have a soul tie with it. And you can go in and break the grief. Which happened. And this person got set free. Now, I'm trying to figure this out too. You have a pastor that is learning at a level of speed that most people don't ever learn at. I've never had to really deal with heavy-duty grief. Yet I have to counsel it. 
and I have to know what I'm doing. Boy, do I, I pray a lot when it comes to that. Shock and disbelief. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people will reach for the phone. I don't know if you've ever had anybody pass away and you reach for the phone to call them. And it feels like they're right there. And it kind of feels like um, you can pick the phone up and talk to them. Like they're not missing. Even to this day, there are moments I need my mom. But for the first few years, I could pick the phone up to go to call her and then remember, she wasn't there. To me, that's a little bit of a shock syndrome that happens. You expect people to show up. This is another thing that happens. A loved one passes away and you are sure you saw them in the mall. Looks just like them, back of their head. It's their hair, it's exactly how they stand, even sideways. You are positive it's them. My mom. A similar image of my mom shows up in a photograph, in a boat, looking out a window. Is that a little freaky? I actually have tapped people on the shoulder and said, Hey! And they turn around and I realize, Oh, that's not that. I'm sorry. I, I thought you were somebody else. I know my sister said she was sure she saw Tasha. Looks just like Tasha, the back of Tasha. And then realized it wasn't her. But a lot of times, shock allows you to look for somebody, even in a crowd, even though they've passed away. You can see a similarity. My mom, I'll tell you what was freaky, is me. One day, I laughed, and the voice that came out of me was my mom. I was like, a lot older. I mean, I'm, I'm like 50 years old. And I'm laughing. And, and, uh, and I stopped. I went, oh. Oh, that's not good. Somebody said, what? I said, that was my mom. Mm -hmm. That was like, it just came out. It was identical laughter. Second year after she passed away, my hands were in the sunlight. And my veins popped out for some reason. And my hands were identical to my mom. And I went, oh, mom, I have your hands. Now I have a laugh like you. Where'd that come from? It's very interesting when people say, you look just like your dad, just like your dad. But your dad's not there. And it triggers something in you. A profound sadness sometimes. A deep loneliness that does not get repaired. So when somebody tells you get over it, that it gets better, I don't believe grief gets better. I believe it gets different is the word you're looking for. You process it differently. You think of it differently. If someone you know you're not sure you will see them again because you don't know if they're in heaven. And you know what the word says. And you're grieving because I might be missing him forever. You know that first scripture? And he will wipe away all tears from your eyes. And there'll be no more sorrow. I do believe one of the greatest griefs people can carry is when one of their parents refused or did not have any knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they're no longer here. But my daddy says it like this. You're not the judge. God holds you accountable for what you know. Don't take over his seat. 
you leave this in the hands of God. No one knows. I remember the story of the one lady. They called her and they said, I wanted to let you know that your son was killed in an accident. And she said, you got to be kidding me. No, no way. She sobbed. She was so angry with God. How could you let him die? I have been praying for him for years, God. He is yours. He belongs to you. And you failed me, God. A few years later, she ran into a woman and said, you know, aren't you the mom of the young boy that passed away? And she described where the scene of the accident was. And she said, yes. She goes, I, I wanted to tell you something. I didn't get a chance. I was on that scene. I came across to with my car. And I prayed with your boy and led him to Jesus. And I wanted to make sure you knew that. And I needed to find you, and I didn't. What that did at that moment changed everything in her life. Never judge where someone spends eternity because you're not their God. And so in saying that, I tend to think, oh, God, you know, this person, psh, they spent some time in prison. I know what they did. They did this and they did that. They did, they did this and that. And Ted Bundy, you know, serial killer. James Dobson strolls in there the day before he is to be executed and sits down to talk with Ted Bundy. Now, I knew all about Ted Bundy, some of the crimes and the cannibalism and all the stuff he was doing. It was in the newspapers everywhere. And James Dobson says, so how did it all begin, Ted? And he begins to share. And he shares about Jesus, who saved him. Even though he's going to die tomorrow, he knows that God's forgiven him. Man hasn't. But between him and God, he has made some things right. I thought, whoa, that's a serial killer, God. Certainly we're not as bad as that. Huh, I've seen a lot of people kill a lot of people off with their words. Oh, but that's different. Yeah, right. Guilt. People feel guilty that they couldn't save a person. They couldn't rescue somebody. They also feel guilty. And I've seen this. I take full responsibility that I lost my marriage. It takes two. But I've also seen it take one. I'm serious. So I'm playing hardball here with you. I've seen people that weren't at fault for the loss they went through. Somebody decided to go have an affair. Somebody lost a job purely because they were downsizing and didn't want to pay your insurance any longer. It wasn't your fault. But loss doesn't always point a finger and say, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. A lot of times, people feel guilty they could not rescue somebody and save somebody. They couldn't prevent a death. Even if there was something or nothing that could have been done about it. So they carry the guilt of that, of that loss. They're angry. Especially, I see this all the time, angry at the doctors. Man, doctors get the shaft. Angry at the doctor because he should have known he prescribed the wrong medication. Wow. Fear. 
fear that you're gonna pass away just like somebody else passed away or now you're alone and you're gonna face life alone the rest of your life. Almost every divorced woman I know has dealt with fear. What am I gonna do? There's not enough. I have the whole responsibility of repairing the roof, cleaning the car, mowing the lawn, taking and maintaining the whole property. And they're afraid. How do you think I'm going to be able to do it all, God? They get fatigued. You see many times they have nausea. They lose a lot of weight or they gain a lot of weight. They have a lowered immunity. Somebody that's dealt is dealing with grief has a lot of different aches and pains many times, and we see fibromyalgia. We see chronic fatigue syndrome. Sue, are there some other ones that are, are just prominent in the field? Well, mental health, big time. All the time. They'll deal with depression, anxiety, and panic attacks. I'm so glad I run to Jesus. It doesn't fix everything in my life. But he sure is my crazy glue. Without him, literally, there's some extra pieces broken over here. I think I'm fixed. You know, well, sis, we left one on the ground. Do you mind if I put it in? Oh, God, that one hurt. But he fixes me. And I run to him. He's my Abba. Insomnia. Lack of sleep. I'm grieving so I can't sleep. At nighttime, I'm thinking about it all night. Get your pen out and begin to write down, Dear God, I can't sleep. This is why I can't sleep. And begin to process it. We have really good writers here. I'm not even going to look at anybody in the room, but we have really good writers that put words down that I've never heard before from their heart. They say things to God that I go, wow. You need to turn to friends, family, church. You need to turn to people and say, I'm really struggling. I'm having a hard time with this. Find somebody you trust with your heart. Anyways, I like this one too. Some people don't like people to comfort them. First of all, if somebody is going through grief, don't try to hold them unless they want you to. Don't put your hands on them and rock them, pat them, or... Hold on to them oh, and rub their back and their arms. And, you know, unless you got permission. It's okay to put your, your hand on their back and say, how you doing? How you doing? If you need me, I'm here. Uh, this is my phone number. Call. I've been through that. Or maybe you haven't been through that. Still offer. I had somebody come up to me Sunday after church and say, hey, just want you to know if there's anything we can do for your family right now. With dad in the hospital, let us know. And I said, I will. And she said, no, I, I really mean it, though. You just, I really mean it, though. Join a support group if you need to. Really? So me, I got an opinion here. I haven't seen support groups really change the grief in someone's heart. Maybe a friend that has walked through it can help you. But I have seen a lot of support groups that became big pity parties. Depending on who you listen to for wisdom will make the difference. If you link up with a jerk for your wisdom, and Jasta can attest to this, if you get your wisdom when you're going through grief from somebody who hates God or they're resentful, they're going through a divorce, 
Well, I've got one, I'm going through it too. Yeah, mine was a complete idiot. <laughs> Their counsel is, is very negative, or what they do is they pat your back. Yeah, you're the same thing. You're going through the same thing as I am. You're right. We have a right to, you know, to feel this way or do this or respond this way. Sometimes, and John Miller told me this. I called him and I said, I think it was so cool, John. I've got a whole bunch of people coming from one area with one disease. They have, they're from a support group. They all want to get prayed for. <laughs> the, the awesomest. You know, kind of like Jesus and the ten lepers. He goes, actually it's not. Julie, Julie said this. That's not a good thing. Because what happens if one gets healed and nine don't? And they talk the other one that did just get healed back into getting sick. Are you sure you really healed? I didn't feel anything. Are you sure? You know. So as much I like the idea of a support group, it better be run by somebody that knows what they're doing. It's not just a hangout for five people. And I understood what he was saying because... One of the people came to get prayed for from this support group. And she had a list of photos. And she said, can you pray for all the photos of these people with like diseases? They hang with me. Now as I'm telling you this story, let me go back just a little bit and tell you. As she said, is it a mere coincidence? that when I was a young teenager at 14, I hooked up with this support group and I decided to do the fundraisers for these people. I had so much compassion. I could feel their pain. I had such empathy for them in this disease. And now I have the disease. I had to process that a little bit. So I ran that by Julie Meller. And she said, yeah. Who you hang with, many times you become. I know that for a fact. If you hang with brutal people or people that haven't, okay, I've been through um, four divorces. And, um, and I'm dating a couple new guys. I always like that couple part. Instead of one. But I'm going to be your counselor. I'm going to be the wisdom you listen to as you're going through your divorce. I can guarantee you that the wisdom and the healing process they have gone through, they have not been through the journey yet that God is bringing them through. So when I say be careful of the support group, make it somebody that has recovered because of their faith in Jesus and can point you in this direction. Make it not just a venting session. Nicholas, their teaching, um, nine, Marriage 911 Recovery, I think that's called Affair Recovery 911. Who they link with and partner with for their wisdom as they are going through healing determines their outcome. Your best buddies with somebody that's an alcoholic and you're an alcoholic too. Unless they have come through successfully in Jesus as Lord and they're solid and whole. Many times when they fall, you fall. And you repeat the same cycle. The same in grief. Linked to somebody that's healthy. All right. So let me mess with this. I got five minutes I can mess. In saying that, someone told me one time, you've never been an addict before. So what makes you think that you can give wisdom to somebody who's been addicted? Do I have to go through your experience to know the wisdom of God? Or to know how to speak healing into your life? I think there's times that there's a benefit in it. 
but I also know you're getting me green and unexperienced when it comes to using drugs because I never did. I didn't have a brother that was killed in a car accident. Could I counsel and give wisdom and comfort to someone working through the process? I believe yes, if the wonderful counselor and the mighty God and the everlasting Father is my source. So, um, very interesting subjects there. Talking to a therapist or a counselor, I love counselors. I absolutely love good counselors. The ones that will give you wisdom and lead you to Jesus, not the ones that just listen and take your money and charge $180 for the hour. If you really just need someone to listen, I'll give you a phone number and they'll charge you 180 bucks and they'll just listen. You can actually get a free counselor online. They'll take your credit card and they'll only charge you $20. $20 for 20 minutes and you can talk. You can tell them anything you need to say. But if you want the wisdom of God on how to heal and recover, interesting. <coughs> Memorial pages on Facebook. Do I like them or hate them? Hmm, that's a good one. We're all going to check in, and we're all going to tell you about this person's life. And I see that often. My aunt just died. 142 po comments later, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You'll be in my thoughts and prayers. I'm so sorry. Is the reason we post our grief to get sympathy? As an announcement? Check your heart out when you grieve. What's my purpose and my motive behind making it public to everyone? Am I looking for their sympathy or am I just posting the announcement that my aunt passed away and she was <coughs> the love of my life? I don't need a hundred comments. But maybe if you're looking at it, now I know I'm picking on people, but I see this every Every day, I see, I call it the sympathy post. I also see the GoFundMe posts. Mm -hmm. On a regular basis, everybody has a GoFundMe for an accident or for an injury or for the loss of someone, funeral expenses. All the time they ask me if I will donate. My wisdom is simply, You cannot pay for the wisdom of God. It's free, and it's a gift. Had a girl call me, and she had miscarried a baby. And nobody paid attention, because she was just early in her pregnancy. It was just, you know, a, a tiny little one. And I asked her in private, how are you doing? And she said, I'm not doing good. And I walked her through some healing. And she said, oh my goodness, at the end, a couple weeks later, oh my goodness, how my heart has changed. I think that's incredible when Jesus does that. Whenever you post something on social media, you're risking something. It has its risks. So make sure you're posting it right if you're exposing your feelings online. If you're going through grief, maintain your hobbies, maintain your faith, your church, your interests. Try not to hibernate and go into um, hibernation and just lock your door and sit in the dark. Also, don't let anybody tell you how you're going to feel and how you should feel. You know what? You shouldn't feel that. You should not be feeling grief like that. Or you should not feel relief 
that your mama died after a long battle with illness. You should not feel relieved because that's a sign of unhealthy grief. Nobody should tell you how to grieve in the process. And then look after your health and plan ahead for triggers like holidays. Birthdays. Milestones that you made together with somebody. Plan ahead. I remember when Nick's job at the Ironworks was lost. 37 years of your life is gone and you have to recover. I remember Matt's health. Five years before that, he was in good health. Now he cannot, he could not walk. His legs shook all night long. All the emotions, all the highs and the lows, all the pain meds that physicians had him on. He grieved. You know what he grieved about? He couldn't go pick mushrooms with his son yeah. in the woods. Really? I personally just think that's just a stupid thing. Oh, really? Since when is it stupid? That's why I said don't tell people how, you know, how they should feel. Well, picking mushrooms is such a small thing. No, it isn't. That was on the top of his list. It was a big deal for him. I can't walk in the woods and pick mushrooms with my son. <coughs> he, that's what he grieved over. I never put down what people grieve over. I don't, I don't stick it down and go, eh. It's not important enough. Then there's complicated grief. Grief. When people don't get better. After they've been grieving, they don't recover. And two years later, they're still in a heavy grief. You would have thought they would have started to make some process or progress and been coming out of it, but they don't. They have the intense longing. They have such a yearning to see somebody they cannot recover. Thank God for heaven. Oh. Sometimes they have dreams and intense images of their loved one. I've actually had people that were grieving that saw their loved one in the room. God showed them a dream of their loved one. They said, what do you think of that? What do you think of that, Pastor Daniil? I dreamed last night, and it was so vivid and so real. I thought my husband was actually in the room. In fact, I think he was. I could feel him. I said, you know, there are moments, and I'm going to tell you this, that God gives you something to hold on to, to comfort your heart. And I don't know if you've ever had that happen. I smelled Nick's mom's cologne. And it's just like she's there. And I opened a book and I found my mom's recipe for carrot cake. And I was like, oh, mom, there, there you are. When you grieve, sometimes you look for little, just little things that will remind you of that person. You don't want to let go of them. But after a person has passed away many times, people will have dreams. I dreamed that we were at dinner and mom walked in. I did that. She was there. She walked in and I cried when I woke up because my mom came to dinner with me. Those are the things you just kind of think, Lord, Lord, is that healing or hurtful? For me, it was healing. It wasn't painful. But I worry when someone is always searching for their loved one. I keep looking for them. I keep looking for them. And it's been years. 
a few years, but they have not had any recovery process. That progress, excuse me. I also worry when people avoid putting up any photos of the person that passed away or talking about them. They're not allowed to mention their name. Or they're very angry or bitter. Or they feel their life is empty or meaningless and they've actually um, imagined that their loved one is probably still alive but living somewhere else. I know you all looked at me and said, really? Yes. There are times people don't process it. He said, I'm sure they're really not dead. That's how I feel. And I really worry the most when they're suicidal and they plan their own death. Or they no longer can walk. They can't function at home. And they carry huge grief. Huge guilt with their grief. Can antidepressants help you? Probably not. Ooh, that's a bad one. Now I'm going to tell you that. Antidepressants sometimes can help, but sometimes it masks your grief. When I say it can sometimes help, if you're really into a state of depression that is causing many symptoms, you need to see a counselor. They'll refer you to a psychiatrist. They may medicate you. It will probably not help your grief. It will get rid of some <coughs> symptoms. But if the grief is in your heart, antidepressants don't work on your heart. Only God does. And wisdom. So, in saying that, am I against medication? No. I'm absolutely for medication when it's necessary. <coughs> But I've seen people that Jesus set free in, in an hour and a half. I've seen people that they return. Over a period of two or three months, we've shared, they've talked, I've listened. And I was that person on the other end of the phone that just sat and listened and cried with them as they began to heal. If someone ever wishes, you wish that it was you that died instead of your loved one. You wish that you could take their pain. Or you blame yourself. Or you are so numb and disconnected from others, from other people. You no longer trust people. You no, you no longer can speak about it. You're unable to perform normal daily activities. First of all, I want you to be gentle with yourself. And I want you to get some help. I want you to find a really good friend or a really good pastor that you love. And I want you to talk about it with them. I always invite people, come for coffee. Come for coffee. And let's just share our heart. You share your heart, I'll listen. If God gives me a word for you, I'll tell it to you. Now I'm picking on Sue, who's sitting here. But Sue worked in a hospital, and she encountered many people, even children, that go through severe depression. Grief is not limited to just adults. Children can go through grief, and they grow, go through it differently, I believe, than adults. That's a whole other subject. But if you have a child that's going through grief, don't poo-poo it that they can't grieve over grandma who passed away. Take it real serious. Um, I think part of it is, is that kids have to be safe. And when something traumatic happens, they, their safety is in jeopardy. They just 
and that brings them into that. They they go through that grieving area like you're speaking. Go back and check. Um, when your world is shaken up and you're a child, somebody told me the other day um, that young children shouldn't have to ever deal with death. I understand that. They shouldn't have to under de or deal with um, or understand loss. But I can remember one of my boys standing at the casket. We took him to the funeral of my mom. And he stood at the casket and he looked in. And he reached out and touched my mom's hand. And he said, Mama, she's not in there. Where is she? And I went down to the lake and I got a seashell, a clam. And I said, do you know what was inside of this? And I showed him. And it's not there anymore. All that remains is the shell. That was her shell. The grandma's in heaven with Jesus. And I wrote a song. Mama, and I went through every question he said that day to me. Is Jesus coming today? <coughs> Do I get to see Grandma in heaven? How far are the stars away? How late does Jesus get to stay up? <laughs> does God have a mommy like you? Will I get to sing in heaven's choir? Can I fly like the angels do? Mama, what's that tear on your face for? Are you sad? Did you get hurt? Can I pray and Jesus make it better? Here's my sleeve. Wipe your tears on my shirt. Mama, just sing a song. Come over to the piano and sing something, something about Jesus, Mommy, won't you? And I sat down at the piano. I wrote down every word he had just said to me. I don't know where it came from. And I began to play. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And I just played and I just sang. And in that moment, I realized that when he had touched my mom's hand, he was okay. I wasn't the one that, I was the one that wasn't okay. He was good, I wasn't. He had already processed the fact Oh, she's not in there. Where'd she go? Heaven. Oh, okay. Will I get to see Grandma in heaven? Yes, honey, you will. What? Do you think God has a mama like you? I won't forget those moments. Grieve your own way. And it's okay. No time frame. And no one is going to put you down as you go through the process of how important it is for you to grieve or not grieve. If you've already come through it, there'll still be highs and lows. There'll still be waves. At certain times of the year, there'll be a wave of grief that just kind of washes over and doesn't leave. If you've lost a child, sometimes it's a, watching another little child play, all of a sudden a, a wave comes over. A certain smell of lilac, my mom's favorite. I, when I smell it, mm, it's grandma. Don't minimize it. Don't try to heal so quickly. I've got to heal right now. My time's up. It's okay. God will walk you through it, and it will be a process.
and you will heal differently than the next person. Henry. I was like you when, when mom passed away, you know, you said you had a, you didn't, you didn't grieve openly like, well, I was the same way when my mom passed away. She'd been sick for a long time and weeks, we knew she was gonna die. We expected it. And so when it came, it really wasn't a grieving time because we had grieved before that, mm -hmm. but it was the void that they left. They weren't there anymore, and that void was what was hard to fill. Empty houses are very hard to fill. Yep. Quiet moments, hard to recover from the quiet. Don't forget the children. We have little people. When they grieve, they grieve a little bit differently, but they still grieve. And by the way, old people still grieve. And many times when one passes, the other one will pass within a week. They're connected. And that is real common. So I'm going to pray. Father, I just thank you for tonight. You know our hearts. You know all the processes that we have been through. And God, I ask, as we recover our hearts from grief, only you know the process. Only you can heal us. So heal us, Father. Heal us. Heal our hearts, our emotions, our minds. And God, I thank you that you alone are the judge. You judge the living and the dead. You're the only one that knows moments before and moments during of a person's life. And I thank you, Father, for your comfort as we heal in the journey from grief and loss. In Jesus' name, thank you, Jesus.